afternoon. Thanks for coming to this. Um, I thought that uh, we'd touch on some elements of neurohospitalists now. Some of the pieces to talk about will be just sort of general neurohospitalist practice, and then maybe we'll touch a little bit on sort of where things might be going and what we tend to do in hospitals over time. And so I thought I'd open up with just kind of a, an experience that I had in the hospital the other day. And so some of you may, who've practiced in the hospital a lot may have had this experience where there's sort of two types of care that are happening in a lot of our places now. And so sitting in the emergency department, it was about 7.30 in the morning, and I had gotten a call to see a patient who didn't have the most emergent of symptoms, but had symptoms that were very concerning to her uh, and were significant and that required a fairly urgent evaluation. And so in our community, she couldn't get in to see a neurologist for about three months. And so there wasn't a lot of ability for her to get in, so she ended up coming to the emergency department, sort of right or wrong, that happens. Uh, and instead of just getting an evaluation by the emergency physician, as a neurohospitalist, just by being there, I was able to see her, really spent 20 minutes kind of allaying her fears, uh, cut off a number of studies that the emergency doc would have done otherwise. So there was the usual MRI of the brain, MRA of the head and neck, um, and just kind of some other stuff uh, that had already been ordered. So we stopped all the imaging and really just sat down and talked with her for 15 minutes and was able to send her home directly from the emergency department. So the intervention was just time and spending less money in the emergency department, which is an unusual thing to be able to accomplish. At the same time that was going on, uh, and I should say at, the, at this hospital, there's a neurohospitalist service and then there's a group that does not use the neurohospitalist. And so while this was going on, at the same time, uh, I heard an acute stroke come in and a page go out to the neurologist. And so it was relatively minor symptoms, but there was an acute stroke, or as it turned out to be a TIA. And the patient in that room was waiting. They were getting all their imaging and sort of going down that direction. But it took about 25 minutes for the neurologist to answer the page. And so that's a neurologist who was busy, who was in clinic, who was seeing other patients. Uh, and in that time, I had already done a consult stopped the imaging that was going on, uh, spent some time talking to the patient, and the message that the patient in the room next door had gotten was, this is an emergency, the emergency doctor is going to see you, we're gonna do a lot of imaging, and we're waiting for the neurologist to call back. And we'll wait some more for them to call back. And while this was going on as well, I had a busy inpatient neurohospitalist service, I had about 20 patients on service, and I got about 15 texts. So secure text to talk between myself and the hospitalist about what was going on with a number of these different patients that I'd already seen in the hospital. So I was able to help manage those, able to help prioritize sort of which patient I would see after I left the emergency department, and able to help the hospitalist actually discharge a couple of those patients in the morning uh, without me having seen them because I knew the case and had talked about them the day before. So during the time I was able to, and it's really nothing magic, it was just a matter of being there and being accessible. And so during those 15 or 20 minutes, I helped in the care of a dozen or so patients. I saw a patient in person and sent them home. And at about that time, the traditional neurologist who had a busy clinic practice called back about the acute stroke. And so you can see there's a huge disparity in care. I don't know if there's a difference in outcomes between those patients, but it's a common experience you get uh, and it makes you sort of feel uncomfortable sitting in the hospital realizing that you're delivering one type of care while at the same time there's another type of care going on in the next room. And different messages are getting to that patient and everyone gets frustrated along the way. So the nurses are frustrated, the emergency docs are frustrated, uh, I'm frustrated hearing that it's going on and I can't really jump in. If it had been something more emergent I would have. Um, and the neurologist in clinic who is probably seeing three patients who are double booked at the same time is frustrated knowing that they have a call that they can't answer because they're so busy. And so that's one of the big reasons why the neurohospitalist model has been successful is because we can deliver a different kind of service. And so I'll go through a few of the reasons behind this to sort of amplify a few points. And so some of it has to do with the changing acuity in the hospital. And so it's hard to be an outpatient neurologist, as many of you know, and still take care of very sick patients in the hospital. So the patient acuity has changed, and the patient length of stay has changed. So there's something different about the patients we're seeing now. There's not the expectation 
that if you come in as a neurohospitalist, you'll, you'll slash lengths of stay because they're already getting pretty tight. So when I started doing this about 15 years ago, our average stay in our critical care unit, I, and I was doing medicine at the time, our average care, uh, excuse me, length of stay on ventilator was about eight and a half days. So huge length of stay on ventilator because the only pulmonologist in our critical care unit had a busy outpatient practice. So within a year, we changed the time on ventilator to four and a half days, and it's gone down since then. So we're able to half the time on ventilator, which has a huge cost savings, but also has a huge morbidity improvement from a patient standpoint and mortality improvement too. So the patients have changed. The other piece has changed is what do the patient's people, so who, what do the families expect? And so in most of our hospitals, there's hospitalists there who if a family has concerns or questions during the day, can expect someone to come and talk to them two or three times during the day, or when they're able to get there. And so everyone has busy schedules. And so that level of service and that service expectation has changed. And so it's hard to say, okay, the hospitalist is here talking to the patient, but the neurologist can come by at six in the morning when everyone's asleep, can come by at noon, but they're in a hurry, or can come by late. And so the patient's families who need to make really difficult decisions, and the other physicians who really value a neurologist's opinion aren't necessarily good anymore about waiting around for that stuff to happen. And so as a neurohospitalist, we can make a big difference on that front, too. And so what about providers and hospitals? And so one of the other changes that's happened over time is there has been, and I'd say in a lot of cases there still is, sort of an us and them approach to hospitals. And so as a neurologist and as a physician, it's us physicians, us as the medical staff, working against the hospital. And so the hospital is sort of the enemy in this case, and we're trying to figure out our way to sort of carve out a piece of what they're doing. And it becomes very hard to align the interests. In particular, if I'm busy trying to keep my practice afloat, I need to see X number of patients to pay my overhead, and the longer I spend in the hospital, the less money I make, really. Um, and it's harder to be in two places at once. That changes when your job is to be in the hospital. It's sort of like the difference between uh, being on call and being on a night shift. So if you just take call in the hospital and you get called in at two in the morning, you are not very happy because you're working the whole day, you're there at two in the morning, you could be home asleep. When you're doing a night shift in a hospital, when it's two in the morning, that's your shift. So you're supposed to be there. And it's amazing what it does to your attitude just sort of walking between patients in the hall um, when you're tired, maybe equally in both situations. And so as a neurohospitalist, we become more and more aligned with the way the hospital works. And so it's not an us and them situation. It's how do we provide the best care possible together, recognizing what the constraints are. And it requires really learning a different kind of language than we're trained for in medical school. So I need to know what the return on investment is for my group. I need to know what our impact on length of stay is. I need to know what our readmission rate is. And I can also use that information to drive change in my group. And so uh, we looked at a large group of hospitalists and looked at the number of readmissions and the length of stay based on our staffing. And so it would be dischargers per FTE, so per full-time equivalent hospitalist. And what we saw over time is above a certain range, certain number of patients per day, the readmissions rate went up and the length of stay went up, sort of like you'd imagine would happen. So when you go to administration and say, you know, we need more staffing, it's not an abstract discussion of, oh, you know, we're busy and we're tired and we need more help because I'm working a lot of hours. It becomes a discussion of we're burning providers out. There's real problems with the care we're providing. We're not feeling safe. And look at this graph that shows once we get above so many dischargers per FTE, our quality metrics change, which have an effect directly on patient care, but also have a financial impact as well. And so, it, it allows you to speak that language, but also feel like your interests are aligned with those of the hospital too. Which gets to some, some of the systems and process pieces. And so you start to be able to get in a situation where you can change the systems in a hospital and the processes as well. 
I think the, the most common one with which we're all familiar is how you develop a stroke program. And so you look at the different elements of how you do, what your times are in doing that, and then you develop what the metrics are for your success. The nice part is if you're supposed to be in the hospital and you're supposed to be busy helping the hospital work efficiently, you can really put the patient in the center, so the patient-centered care piece of this. And we just started a, a neurohospitalist service at a second hospital, and we started making decisions that they weren't used to. And so they were decisions made based on how the patient should be treated, irrespective of what it did for sort of our numbers during the day, and without really looking at a financial impact directly on each provider, but rather on the impact of the system as a whole. So we decided to take on an additional group of patients, and the initial response was, well, what's, the, what's your income bump from that, or do you get paid more to take on that group of patients? And the answer was, I, I don't have any income difference by taking on that group of patients, but if I'm not busy during the day, and there's a group of patients who aren't being well cared for, and I'm in the hospital anyway, my job should be just to take that group of patients on. And if it gets too busy, we'll sort out what additional staffing we may need, we're started in it that worked. They still didn't exactly understand it up front, but everyone benefited from that change. And as the volumes have started to go up as a result of that, we're talking about uh, hiring an advanced practice provider to help us meet that need. But instead of the argument up front being about finances and schedules, it was about what do we do for the patient? How do we improve the patient care? And part of our job is to improve that systems. It's an alignment of interests. And so I may spend 10 hours with the radiologist saying, you know, I really want a CT perfusion or I really don't in this kind of situation. Um, we need to shave 10 minutes off the CT angiography time. Some of that is because it makes my life easier too, right? And so I don't have to call up to get all those studies done. I have a pathway, a protocol, and a process in place. Um, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. The system works a lot more easily to me and the patients do better overall as well. And so it's a way of sort of changing your world view as opposed to just being a neurologist who works in the hospital sometimes and it's us versus them to a neurohospitalist who works with the hospital to try to improve care. And so that's really the, the goal of what we're doing. And if you change it the right way, you really end up doing what you like to do. And so you don't want to be under the illusion that, okay, I'm going to become a hospital employee, I'm just going to work in a hospital, or I'm going to become a neurohospitalist for a large neurology group and be privately employed, and that's going to solve all the problems. It's a different set of problems you run into, but ideally you can do what you like to do. So there are those of us who don't like to have predictable days. Um, there are those of us who don't like to have to watch a clock and see when the next appointment is. If I need to spend 20 minutes with a patient, I'll spend 20 minutes with them talking about something to make them feel comfortable, and I may be sort of a little bit later for the next patient, but they're not expecting me at 10.45, followed by 11, followed by 11.15. And so I'm able to feel like I do what's right for that patient. The downside is I don't necessarily have a schedule that's written in stone. And so I may, my pager goes on at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, and I leave when the work's kind of done and I may do that for seven days in a row, and at the end of those seven days, I'm tired. Those are long days, particularly if you're taking call along that way too, but then I may have seven days off, and that's completely off. I don't have an office, I, my pager goes off, and if I don't have other administrative things, I'm out of the hospital. And so it's a matter of finding those trade-offs that work for you and what kind of position appeals to what you like to do. And so I'll wrap it up there, but that's the idea behind being a neurohospitalist, really, is being able to find that core group of become a systems thinker um, and to be able to deliver a different type of care to a different population of patients. And we've made a pretty dramatic change in the inpatient sort of uh, landscape nationally now with about 1,700 neurohospitalists, a field that's about 10 years old overall, and I think we'll continue to see that change over time.